welcome back uh, to the second day of the uh, mini lecture series. And so uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Professor Elizabeth Baldwin uh, joining us and uh, uh, teach today. Okay, so uh, one thing I learned from the last time uh, yesterday was that, well, um, there are so many people who wanted to uh, ask questions and well, um, good ones. So uh, one thing I should not do is to spend too much time before as I begin to talk, to talking about uh, her stuff. Okay. Um, let me, however, still, still just a few minutes uh, to introduce, uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Elizabeth. Okay. So again, the um, uh, uh, Professor Elizabeth Baldwin uh, is associate professor uh, from Oxford, and uh, where she also got a PhD. Well, DPhil, uh, I guess, uh, as in, uh, uh, but she would say, uh, also from Oxford. Okay, uh, in two thousand thirteen. Uh, uh, okay, um, okay, I, I got a year mixed. Um, before that, um, so she is also a DPhil of, of mathematics, uh, also from Oxford. Okay, so the, um, so the, I believe that the first. I met uh, Elizabeth was when I visited uh, Oxford for a seminar um, in 2013, I think. And around that time, the, uh, there's a kind of rumor or, or sort of like uh, word of mouth among economists that uh, the distinguished uh, economist uh, Paul Klemper uh, and um, and a young mysterious mathematician uh, have um, found a way to use a sort of very new mathematical tool uh, to analyze uh, individual goods economy. Okay, so you know me and my colleagues and people around me uh, talked about about it without really knowing what it is. Okay, so I was really looking forward to learning about it uh, when I was visiting, and I think that's when I I met this uh, young mysterious uh, mathematician, um, uh, um, right, uh, Elizabeth. And it took some time for, well, I kind of remember that uh, uh, it took several years uh, for more and more economists began to appreciate how good, uh, how, how useful uh, the tools that they, are, uh, they have introduced uh, is. Um, now, uh, the, uh, the paper is, the, the first paper, I guess, uh, in her agenda uh, with, with Paul uh, is, um, published in Econometrica in 2019 and became sort of part of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the common um, reference uh, when, uh, for people who want to study it. So uh, I think I basically teach this paper uh, every year uh, whenever I have a chance to teach a PhD. Um, so, the, well, um, so I should confess, so uh, part of the uh, uh, great thing about this paper and the, 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 and the related uh, the, the literature um, she's uh, um, uh, driving force of is that the, it's, really, it's really intuitive. So to understand the geometric structure uh, of the demand, uh, I should confess, however, I still do not feel that I have a deep understanding of the, uh, every aspect of the paper. You know, let, let's face it, the uh, new, te new technologies are usually not too easy for all people who do not uh, uh, know much about it. Okay, so um, I believe that some of the uh, people here um, also read the paper, uh, but uh, still has uh, not understood everything in the paper. So, okay. Um, so we are very happy, however, today uh, the, we can hear from the, uh, you know, the inventor, the originator of uh, this research agenda. So uh, we are very happy to, uh, um, uh, to hear uh, from the uh, Professor Elvis Bodin. So again, let's welcome her. So Thank you very much. And I, I didn't realize you'd been teaching this paper. So that's, that's very um, flattering. Um, I hope you won't find the first part of this talk boring. <laughs> um, as I will be, I will be talking about that paper, but also, uh, also some more recent work with Paul. So hopefully, uh, that's something to hang on for if the uh, if the earlier parts of this talk are familiar to, to, to some of you. I hadn't realised how many people were reading this paper. Uh, so I I'm, I've uh, titled my talk today uh, the geometry of pre preferences 
demand types, equilibrium within divisibilities and bidding languages. This is to sort of encompass my longer term project with Paul Klemperer. So all this work is in collaboration with Paul. And this is starting, as Alex alluded to yesterday, with the question of the product mix auction, but then going back and saying, hang on, let's use a lot more geometry to understand exactly what we're doing here and then go back and work on the product mix auction. As I'll explain, we've worked with a lot of other fantastic economists along the way, some of whom are listed here, some of whose work uh, I will, some of the work with those people I will uh, either mention here or uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's only in the appendix of the slides, so I will only get there if there's time. Uh, but we have had the great advantage of working with many additional co-authors on this. And I should mention that a lot of this was supported by an ESRC grant, although Alex and I, I now have an ERC grant. So uh, it's always important to mention these things. So the initial objective was to address real world situations in which new auction designs are needed. And the way we tried to go about doing that was using geometric approaches to represent bidders' preferences. This is what Paul started uh, before he met me uh, when he was working uh, for the Bank of England in the financial crisis, uh, building up the preferences out of simple geometric pieces, which were easy to understand and work with, and which could be aggregated in a nice, simple way. And so he was working on developing new bidding languages. And then uh, I sort of uh, wandered into economics as at that point, as Vito says, uh, at that point I had been a mathematician, but I started studying economics at Oxford and started talking to Paul very soon. So uh, he had developed the Bank of England language. We went on to develop the strong substitute language and the all substitutes language, which we've been working on very recently together. And there is also a language that uh, was developed for the Icelandic auction, which I may touch on at the end of this. And uh, what are these languages? I will have an opportunity, I hope, to talk about them all in the later part of the talk. But a key feature of the first three is we might call them tropical languages. Uh, which is because they're based on our understanding of uh, economics and economics of indivisible goods in particular, derived from thinking about tropical geometry. And so that's what I will discuss in the first part of the talk. The last, the last uh, auction in this list doesn't actually have these properties. Uh, we use our inspiration of being used to thinking about things geometrically, uh, but not actually the precise tools that we developed. And so since those, the, the first three are, are tropical and the final one is uh, uh, was developed for Iceland, we call that one an Arctic language as uh, I guess a bit of a joke. Uh, so the, the, that's the first three bullet points of the agenda. The, the first bullet point of the agenda is to understand preferences and equilibrium for indivisible goods. And that's the bullet point of the agenda that ties exactly back with what Alex was talking about yesterday. And that's the bullet point of the agenda that corresponds exactly as Fajito was saying, to the first paper, the paper that was uh, published in uh, uh, 2019. Uh, whereas the, uh, the, the part of the agenda that was initially planned, uh, we're actually coming to second because we found we needed to really get the, the, uh, the, the more fundamental stuff nailed down. And so similarly for this talk, despite the fact that you might say that the interesting applied part of the agenda and the new work is the the paper corresponding to the auctions, I am going to very much start with the background paper explaining what these uh, uses of geometry in this economic context are, so what these demand types are, what they have to do with equilibrium within divisibilities, and exactly the sort of format that Alex was talking about yesterday. So as an introduction then to the understanding preferences paper, we think about the hotel with two rooms. This is uh, an example uh, very uh, similar to what Alex was talking about yesterday, but I thought I'd go through it in, in a bit more detail in case other people at the, at the talk today were less familiar with that. So we have a hotel, it's got two rooms in it, and Elizabeth is willing to pay at most £40 for one room and at most £30 for, for room two. 40, uh, uh, room one is, is slightly nicer for some reason. So we note that at prices above 40, 30, Elizabeth is not prepared to buy a hotel room. And if, uh, if the hotel room uh, two is too expensive, then she definitely wants room one. Uh, if hotel room one is too expensive, she definitely wants room two. 
and we're going to divide up the space between the two of them with a 45 degree line. We will come back to why it is at 45 degrees. So that's Elizabeth's preferences in price space. Alex has similar preferences, but he is a little bit more generous in terms of how much he's prepared to pay for either room. He'll pay £60 for room one, £40 for room two. So if both of them turn up and look at this hotel, then we see that the uh, aggregate demand across the two of them for hotel rooms looks like this. It's easy to aggregate their demands, we just add them up. And so we see that there are prices giving rise to a competitive equilibrium, just as we saw in this sort of example with Alex yesterday. But suppose Paul comes along. Now, Paul, unlike Alex and Elizabeth, has children who sleep in a different room from him, children who are more than a year old. So uh, they don't want to share a room with Paul. They want to have a separate room. And he needs to have rooms both for himself and Meg and for the children, or this hotel is no good to him. He'll go somewhere else. So he's willing to pay at most £50 for both rooms. Otherwise, he'll take neither. He'll just go somewhere else. So if Paul and Elizabeth are both there at the hotel, we see we have a problem because if the sum of the prices is less than Paul is willing to pay, uh, then there's excess demand for hotel rooms. If the sum of the prices is more than Paul is willing to pay, there's excess supply for hotel rooms. And if it's on the margin, then Paul can choose which situation we're in. So a competitive equilibrium does not exist in this model. And this is exactly because Elizabeth sees the hotel rooms as substitutes and Paul sees them as complements. But it's also exactly because of the shape of the combination of things that I have been drawing here, which I will now go back to and explain the, the fundamentals of in more detail. So the unimodularity theorem that I will be coming to explains what's the difference between Elizabeth and Alex showing up and Elizabeth and Paul showing up. It explains that competitive equilibrium will always exist if we have an Elizabeth and Alex type situation, and it'll sometimes fail if we have an Elizabeth and Paul type situation. And we will interpret in terms of pictures, in terms of what things look like, things that are economically meaningful, but also mathematically easy to get your hands on, uh, which is why we then get such a strong theorem out. In particular, we get a necessary and sufficient, sufficient characterization of the sort of properties that we can guarantee equilibrium with. It's easy to test and it exhibits entirely new classes. So as Alex said, a lot of work in this field has talked about the substitutes case, the, the strong substitutes case, are also referred to as the unnatural concave case. We see here, using this theorem, that we can go entirely outside of that case and talk about completely different characterizations of preferences. But if we just go back to the hotel for a moment, Elizabeth uh, was willing to pay at most £40 for room one, £30 for room two. Paul was willing to pay at most £50 for both rooms. Suppose Paul is a bit more generous. Suppose Paul is willing to pay uh, £80 for both rooms. Then competitive prices do exist in that little triangle there, where prices are above 40, 30, but they sum to less than 80. So it's not a complete dead loss if Elizabeth and Paul turn up to the hotel. It's possible that they'll be in equilibrium. It depends on what happens when we precisely compare their precise valuations. If we compare this situation to the previous one, we notice that there are two intersections between the figures drawn here. And here there's only one intersection. Now this, this geometric fact actually corresponds to the existence of equilibrium in this, this case, and the failure in this case. This may seem nothing to do with economics, but these intersections are in fact important for the existence of this equilibrium. So this takes us to our, our second result in this paper, the intersection count theorem, that given the sets of bundles that the agents are considering, we can predict the maximum number of intersections between these lines that we draw. And if you meet that bound, if you've got exactly the maximum number of intersections that you ought to have, then you get an equilibrium. And if there are fewer intersections than that, then under certain conditions, equilibrium will fail. So this is not looking at the overall properties, uh, just at the overall properties of the two agents' um, valuations, but at the way they go together. So the unimodularity theorem looks at properties of valuations that guarantee equilibrium, 
Whereas the intersection count theorem looks at profiles of valuations, the precise valuations and how they go together relative to one another for which equilibrium exists. I'll spend more time talking about the unimodularity theorem, but I think the intersection count theorem is a, a fun additional insight that you can get from these geometric tools. So uh, the outline of the, the talk I'll be giving today then, I will talk first about individual valuations and trade-offs and what we can do with this geometry in order to understand and classify valuations. I'll talk about how to stick them together in terms of aggregations, which actually works very easily indeed. So we can lead straight on from there to competitive equilibrium between agents. When does it exist? When is it guaranteed? And why is that now that we understand a bit more about the geometry of these valuations in a sense? And then finally, I will go back to that product mix auction application and talk a bit about how these tools can enable us to develop bidding languages that represent whole classes of references. So to start at the beginning, uh, and I have attempted to make my notation correspond mostly, let us say, with what Alex was using yesterday to help everyone. Uh, I apologize if there are discrepancies in that. So we have uh, indivisible goods. Now, you will notice that I seem to have my axes upside down and back to front. I always draw the axes for goods upside down and back to front when I'm going to put them next to a price axis, as I'm about to, because you will see that the that way things line up better. So uh, just take, 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 take it for now that my axes are going to be upside down and back to front, and we will, uh, we will see shortly why that is. So here, here are my indivisible goods, and there is some finite set of them available to our agent. And there's a valuation on that. We have quasi linear utility. By the way, the whole of this talk is quasi linear. Now, Alex made a very good case yesterday for why we shouldn't restrict ourselves to the quasi linear case. But he also did mention that the quasi linear case makes things easier. And I hope some of the details that I will be getting into in this talk will show you that actually there's a real value to making things easier because they're quite hard enough as they are in the quasi linear case. But also, we will see that from tomorrow's talk, if we do a lot of good work in the quasi-linear case, then we can go back to the income effects world using that work. So without, without wanting to steal Alex's thunder for the talk tomorrow, we will just be sticking with the quasi-linear case for today. So we have a valuation. And so my utility is valuation minus p dot x. I don't bother with how much money I've got left over because I can go infinitely into death and I don't care. So. It's simply how much I've spent, P dot X. And the agent uh, demands bundles and the uh, demand set maximizing that across the set of uh, bundles that uh, the agent might ever be interested in, their domain. And we are interested in what they demand where. So that's what we draw in price space. We're interested in what they demand where because we want to draw the sort of pictures that I started with uh, talking about uh, and looking at how those things line up. This is how we'll think about auctions, and this is the geometry de we develop these tools. So we work in price space and plot a picture of what is demanded where. How do we plot that picture? Well, we think about where demand changes, because of course, when goods are indivisible, we've just got a finite set of bundles that you could demand. For, for a generic price, if you make a small change, it doesn't make any difference to what you demand. So we have these big open regions in this picture in which demand is just a fixed thing. But when you go from one demanding one thing to demanding another thing, that's when you cross one of these lines. And when you go from demanding one bundle to demanding another bundle, you're gonna have to be indifferent between those bundles along that point. So the thing that we draw is the location of where demand can change. And that is the location of prices at which the demand sets contains more than one bundle. So we call that the locus of indifference prices because the agent is indifferent between more than one bundle on this. So we call this the lip, the location, uh, the locus of indifference prices. And uh, it should just be clear here, we're used to thinking about indifference curves in economics and plotting those and drawing those and developing our intuition from those. On an indifference curve, the agent is indifference, indifferent between the points on the curve. 
whereas on a lip, the locus of indifference prices, that's the locus of the points between which the agent is indifferent between bundles. So the agent is not indifferent between this point and this point. The agent would strictly prefer the point with the lower prices. But at both of those points, the agent is indifferent between uh, a unit of good one and a unit of good two. So that's the sort of picture we can draw. And we see that the picture will change if we change our valuation. In particular, if we change our valuation in this case, in, in the original case, if you look closely, you'll see that the value for one unit of each good is lower than the sum of values for the two goods on their own. And so the goods are substitutes in that case. Whereas in this case, the value of uh, one unit of each good is higher than the sum of the two units on their own. So in this case, the goods are complements. And that means that in this complementary case, there are prices between which the agent is indifferent between having nothing and getting a unit of both goods. Whereas when the goods were substitutes, there were prices at which the agent was indifferent between getting one good and getting the other good. So let's go on and, and understand that more deeply. So looking more closely at this lip, this locus of indifference prices, which is the set of prices at which the demand set contains more than one bundle, we see that in two dimensions, it's made up of lines. And in fact, in general, in n dimensions, it will be made up of n minus one dimensional linear pieces. And these we call the facets. This is a really fundamental term for, for the rest of the talk, really. The facets are, if you look at one of my pictures, it's made of lines, the facets are the lines. In higher dimensions, see if you can, you can believe me that this is uh, in three dimensional space, a collection of, uh, two-dimensional linear pieces and those different pieces that I've drawn in different colors, those are the facets. We can think about these economically by thinking, well, there's a bundle that's demanded here and a bundle that's demanded here and a bundle that's demanded here. And the prices uh, at which uh, the agent is indifferent between A and B, for example, they comprise that facet. So we can think about facets as being prices at which the particular bundles between which the agent is indifferent, so they have an economic meaning. But in terms of interpreting our pictures, they're just the linear bits of the highest dimension. We notice by having drawn a picture in a higher dimension that there are also lower dimensional linear bits along which those facets meet. So the facets meet in three dimensions, the facets are two dimensional and they meet along lines. There's a line, there's another line. And those two lines we see meet at a point here. So these are the cells. These are the cells. We've got the top dimension uh, of, of the lip is the facets, but we can carry on down the dimensions. These put themselves together in what's called a polyhedral complex. And the, the lower dimensional cells, for example, the vertical line here, that's the prices at which the agent is indifferent between bundle a, bundles A, B, and C. Uh, but more generally, um, it, it, we can characterize them as a set of prices at which an agent is indifferent between a collection of bundles. We can also just say, look at the picture. It's the bits it breaks down into when you're thinking about it naturally geometrically. And that's the way we tend to think about it. So what do these facets mean economically? Let's start by asking, how does demand change as you cross a facet? So let's focus on the, the facet I've drawn in purple. If we've got a price in that facet, then the agent is indifferent between the two bundles demanded on either side. So we've got our quasi-linear utility, the valuation minus p dot x equals valuation minus p dot y, where x and y are the bundles demanded on either side. We just do a tiny rearrangement of that. We've got p dot y minus x equals change in valuation. Now, if you know your coordinate geometry, you will identify that p dot vector equals constant is the equation of an n minus one dimensional linear bit in two dimensions a line, in three dimensions a plane, etc. So this is exactly the equation for the extension of this facet infinitely in either direction. So that's, that's the equation that we've got being satisfied on our facet. But if you know your coordinate geometry, you will also know that this bit here, the y minus x, that's the normal to the thing you draw. 
So we haven't just got that uh, we've got a, an n minus one dimensional linear bit. We know what its normal is, and its normal is y minus x. Well, y minus x is the change in demand as we cross the facet. So the change in the bundle is in the direction normal to the facet. So that takes us straight between the geometry and the economics. Facet normal is change in demand. That's a really important first point we've got here. Now, that's just a, a directional thing to give us the precise change in demand. We need to also introduce the idea of weight. That's because, for example, if I were to double the bundle demanded in all of the regions around the lip here, then I would double the change in demand as I crossed any of these facets. So I've just got to keep track of that number. And that's, that's a weight then that I associate to every facet of the lip. And finally, we've got a minus sign to worry about. Why, why do I say minus? Well, it's easiest to think about if we look at the top of the picture, if we go along the one one increase in prices, then clearly demand is going to go down in the one one direction. So prices go up, demand goes down. So it's it facet normal times weight is the change in demand, but the change in demand if you had moved in the opposite direction. So okay. that then- Clarification question, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, just a clarification. So when you define the weight, so the can uh, can you can you say what it is again? So in this example, uh, the um, this direction is in the direction of my negative one and one. Mm -hmm. um, so presumably there's some kind of normalization of the. I mean, when, when you look at the direction of this uh, uh, um, uh, this normal vector, uh, the what is a way to define the? Uh, yes, the, I'm I'm the, sorry, I haven't quite got enough details here. So the vector, uh, we could take the vector one, one in this example, we could also take the vector two, two, three, three, et cetera. So we always present these vectors as what we call primitive integer vectors. So I'm sorry, I completely missed that off the slides. So a primitive integer vector just means that the uh, entries are co-prime. So, sorry, so, say again, I, I missed uh, what you just uh, said. The, it, it simply means that the entries are co-prime. So, one, two is a primitive integer vector, two, four is not. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, so we take the primitive integer normal vector, and then we look at what the change in demand actually is. And so then we divide one by the other and say, okay, well, that, that must be what the weight is then. Yeah. Make sense? Thank you, yeah, very nice, thank yeah. you. Was there another question? Okay. I will continue then. So we've got facet normal times weight equals change in demand, where facet normal is presented as a primitive integer vector. And I apologize for not putting that on the slide. So here is a picture of some facets meeting. They are meeting, of course, at an n minus two cell. And if we think about going in a circle around an n minus two cell, so we will cross a selection of facets going in a circle. Uh, we will say facet normal times weight equals minus change in demand, and we will say that again, and we will say that again as we go round in our circle. And we get, we'll get back to where we started, and so the net change in demand had better be zero, because we're talking about that sort of consistent demand, that's that sort of consistent um, reference structure here. So that means if we go in a circle around an n minus two cell, if we add up the weights uh, times the any of the indices of the normal vectors, taking the primitive integer versions, absolutely, we should get zero. And this is what we call the balancing condition. And we see that every lip must be balanced because if not, you wouldn't have a coherent definition of what's demanded everywhere. So that's, that's a necessary condition for drawing a shape of this kind and it actually corresponding to evaluation at all. But what we see is it's actually a sufficient condition as well. So this is mathematically, uh, I think, considered a rather simple point, but economically an incredibly useful point. So if you've got a weighted rational polyhedral complex of pure dimension n minus one, which basically means the sort of picture I'm drawing, that forms the lip of evaluation if and only if it satisfies that property. That's the only property you need to check. You check it locally around these next step down cells from the facets, go around with a collection of facets around one of these next step down cells. Is that true? 
If so, this does come from evaluation. And so what that means sort of immediately to me practically is, oh good, I don't need to bother actually working out valuations. I can just draw little swivelly pictures. And uh, for some of you, you may very much prefer to work with numbers, but I definitely prefer to work with little swivelly pictures. Um, but more deeply, what that means is that uh, as we move on to thinking about representing valuations using um, our bidding languages in the second part of this talk, that will mean that all we need to do is ensure that we have drawn all pictures that we could have draw, could have come up with with a certain property. And that will mean that we have actually depicted all valuations with a certain property, because we can move straightforwardly between the two. Sorry, did, you a, did you have uh, another question? Uh, yeah, I have just a clarification. So firstly, I, I had a little bit uh, hard time remembering what the weight is rational for the complex of pure dimension. Um, so um, so the, in terms of the statement, uh, so what do you mean by saying that the, uh, this object, mathematical object, forms a leap of a variation? Uh, so uh, do you mean that if, if you are given the uh, balanced um, uh, set of vectors and weights, Mm -hmm. then there exists a corresponding valuation uh, over Precisely. The, uh, with this. Uh, OK, I see. Uh, Precisely, yes. OK. So you. I can I can just draw something. Uh, if, if it's a, a polyhedral complex, which basically means it's made up of these linear bits, um, and then I associate to the facets of that some weights and check this balancing condition corresponds around whenever I go in a circle around a collection of facets, if that holds, then the little scribble that I have drawn actually corresponds to an economic valuation. I see, I see. Thank you. Uh, uh, another question, actually. Do, mm -hmm. Does that mean that, so if I understand correctly, given the uh, variation of, uh, of an individual, then you can uniquely pin down this uh, leap, but uh, is uh, how about the opposite uh, direction? So if you have this leap, uh, which is balanced, uh, mm -hmm. do you pin down the variation uniquely or uh, not? Um, it's sort of nearly uniquely. So uh, there's a couple of uh, ways in which it, it, it's, it's ambiguous. You, you could add a constant to the value yeah, of every okay. bundle, and that wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could also shift what's demanded in each region, and that wouldn't make any difference. So if I, if I have this here, I can have 0, 0 demanded here, and uh, 0, 1 demanded here, and 1, 0 demanded here. But I could equally have, um, uh, say, four, five demanded here, and then four, six demanded here, yeah. and five, five demanded here. And finally, um, it, I, I, I can't tell from this picture. Uh, well, actually, in this particular case, I can tell. Uh, but in, in other cases, I may not be able to tell whether it's concave or not. I'll be coming to that later. Mm -hmm. So if we assume that we have identified uh, one of these regions around the lip, what we call unique demand regions, if we identified one where zero is demanded, and we say that the value of zero is zero, and we say that the thing is concave, then it's unique. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. That, that's very clear. Thank you. Brand. I have a, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, quasi-linear utility may be interpreted as a production function. Uh, farm is uh, producing a single uh, commodity whose price is one, mm -hmm. and consumption is input. Mm -hmm. So V of X is revenue, mm -hmm. and uh, minus PX is uh, uh, expenditure or, or cost. Mm -hmm. Right, so you, you can think V as a production function. Mm -hmm. And then we know that, uh, uh, you know, it's associated with profit function. Profit mm -hmm. function pi is a function of input prices, P. Mm -hmm. It's a convex function. Mm -hmm. So uh, this object, LIP, seems to be, you know, the description of profit function. Precisely. It's in fact what we might call the corner locus of that profit function. So if you were to, have I got space to try and draw this? If, 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 we, if we think about working in three dimensions and we've got the, the lip down here, 
Mm -hmm. We can think about in the third value direction, we could try, this is not going to work as quickly profit. immediately, but we could, we, we could try and draw profit in this direction yeah. and we would get something and that what I'm trying to get at here is that that's sloping down and that that's at a different angle and, and we can project down from the bits where the thing on top is not flat, yeah. the bits where the thing on top has a, has a corner, yeah. has an edge. Uh, we can project those so down that, onto the onto yeah. the bottom plane, and that's the lines that we draw. Yeah. So, so the graph of profit function is polyhedron. Exactly, and, uh, the graph it, of profit it, function it is polyhedron. And, you know, edges. Yeah. corresponds to yeah. uh, this uh, this thing lip. Yeah, that's that's okay. precisely the same thing. Absolutely, okay. yeah. That's a very yeah. good understanding. Very good. Yeah. Uh, great. So moving on to classifying valuations using these tools then. So economists classify valuations often by how agents see trade-offs between goods. And in case there are any mathematicians in the audience, as there sometimes are, who haven't seen these things before, we talk about substitutes when we talk about something like tea and coffee, where if I increase the price of tea, that might mean that I demand more coffee. So increasing the price of one good means that I demand more of another good. On the other hand, some goods go together, like perhaps coffee and milk, if that is how you take your coffee. Uh, and so then increasing the price of coffee might mean you demand less coffee, which would also mean you demand less milk. And so increasing the price of coffee would mean that you would demand less milk. So sometimes increasing the price of a good means you demand more of other goods, and sometimes it means you demand less of other goods. And so that's, that's the story when you can take partial derivatives when you're working in a perfectly divisible world, how does this map across to our world of indivisible goods? Well, first, we're going to look at discrete price changes that only cross one facet. So what happens with them? We know that facet normal times weight equals change in demand. We're also going to uh, overlay with this uh, what we call the law of demand. Uh, so this is uh, a sort of common textbook result, which is based on the idea that if prices go up, demand must come down. Now, if you, if you teach microeconomics, then you'll know that uh, you can have given goods, so sometimes it's more complicated than that. But you should also know that given goods arise due to income effects, and we're not going to have those in our transferable utility settings, so things are going to be nice and easy. So the simple version is, suppose at some price you demand bundle X, and suppose we increase the price of good I. So I'm writing EI for the uh, coordinate vector in the i direction. We've just increased the price of one of those goods and we've changed demand from X to X prime. Uh, then uh, it must follow that either actually demand hasn't changed at all or it's gone down for good I. So that's the simple version of the law of demand. Uh, sometimes you might have a more general price change than that. So what's the more general version? Suppose you've got a price at which you demand X. This is demanding uniquely, by the way. We're just looking at changes in demand between you places at which price demand is unique. We've got another price P prime at which demand is X prime. Then it must be the case that the inner product of uh, the difference in price with the difference in demand is negative. Uh, if, if there's been a change at all, if either there's been no change or this inner product must be negative. And it's not hard to see that this version implies this version because then P prime minus P is just that lambda ei and so it must follow that x prime must be less than uh, x prime i must be less than xi so that's the law of demand which i'll be referring to in the next few slides but straightforward in the transferable use of the case so let's go back to our pictures let's just zoom in on a picture which just has one facet in it suppose every facet normal to our lip has at most one positive and at most one negative coordinate entry. Let's just suppose that property happens to hold. And I'm going to decrease the price of good I so that I cross that facet. Then demand changes, well, facet normal times weight is change in demand. So demand changes from X to X plus D where D is a facet normal. And by the law of demand, di had better be positive because we've decreased the price of good i i'm sorry i've gone from decrease increasing prices to decreasing prices but it's the same principle either way so we know by the law of demand that di is greater than zero but we assumed that every facet normal had at most one positive coordinate entry so it follows 
that dj, all the other coordinate entries, are going to have to be weakly negative. So it follows that the change in demand on all goods other than the one whose price we changed are going to be weakly negative. This is exactly what we call substitutes. So we have this restriction on what the normal vectors are. They have at most one positive and at most one negative coordinate vector, and that turns us into substitutes. Okay, so that's the first one. Let's restrict that further. Let's say that we have at most one plus one and at most one minus one coordinate entry. So it's, it's a refinement on the previous condition. It's got to be ones and minus ones. Now, in the same way as before, we must have substitutabilities, but the trade-off between the goods must be one to one. This is those strong substitutes that Alex was talking about yesterday. That's the case when it's not just the goods that are substitutes, but every unit of every good is a substitute. So if we look back at this picture, we see that we're changing from demanding something else to demanding two zero. And so we only want any units of good one if we want two of them, we want both of them at once. And so there must be a complementarity between those two units of the first good. And that problem doesn't arise here. Here, there is no complementarity between the units of the good. We don't have to change each time by one minus one. We could change by, for example, two minus two. That would just be a higher weight on the facet. That would be fine. That wouldn't necessarily reflect complementarity as long as we were happy to take the interim just at the marginal prices as we crossed. So these then are the strong substitutes. So there's an example of strong substitutes. And now we've seen that this is the property for strong substitutes. We can say, okay, well, I can just draw pictures and make sure the slopes are right. And so I can just draw pictures like that and not actually worry very much about what's demanded where, because I'm using the valuation complex equivalence theorem to say, well, this is a balanced picture and it's got the right slopes. So this is a picture of evaluation for strong substitutes. I know it is. I'm not going to work out what that valuation is. I just know that this is a picture of strong substitutes. So is this in higher dimension, if you can quite see what I'm trying to draw here in my attempts to draw three dimensions. On the other hand, we can, we can slightly change our condition. We can say, what if we have all positive or all negative coordinate entries? Well, in that case, when we change, uh, when we decrease demand to cross a facet, again, by the law of demand, the demand has got to go up for the good whose price changed, but we've assumed that the non-zero coordinate entries all have the same sign, so that means demand has got to weakly go up for everything else as well. So this is complements. So we can continue along these lines. What we're doing is we're restricting the set of vectors that can be the facet normals, and then we're identifying that those facet normals define the structure of trade-offs. And so that is all to motivate the definition, which may seem a bit odd at first, but I hope having had that motivation does not seem too odd, of the demand type, which is a really fundamental definition that we introduce, that uh, valuation is of a demand type if every facet of the lip has a normal in a particular set of vectors. So the set of vectors characterize the demand type and that set of vectors are the normals of the lips that we will allow and that set of vectors then are going to define the structure of trade-offs between goods that the agents experience so in our 2019 paper we had uh, thought about things we were really focusing on explaining geometry and we did talk about the relationship between that and the comparative statics a little bit. We had talked about that a good deal more in my PhD thesis, um, but we came back to those ideas and refined them and made them uh, nicer, I think, more recently to really give a comprehensive answer to the question of how the demand types correspond to comparative statics much more recently with Ravi and Alex. So I will just talk about that briefly. So uh, the, the simplest theorem we can give here is when there's only one unit of each good. And in this case, evaluation is of a demand type, if and only if, when we're considering the demand at a price and the demand when we've increased the price of a single good, then either demand hasn't changed or it's changed by uh, a vector in D, the demand type we're talking about. 
So it's clear that if you're not of that demand type, then that property won't hold because there will be an opportunity to do facet normal times weight equals change in demand, which won't be in that set. So if you're not in demand type, that property can't possibly hold. Why does that property imply that you're in the demand type? Well, we've got the law of demand, which tells us that when demand changes uh, in this particular way, so we're increasing the price of good I, it must be that demand for good I must go down. There's only one unit of good I under consideration because we've assumed that the demand set has this form. So we've assumed that there's only one unit of good I. So that means that demand can only change once. So there's only one change. We can only change once so that it must be from this set. So then the demand type vectors give the full set of possible changes in demand. Now that's a rather restrictive theorem for how to think about comparative statics with demand types. So let's give a more general- Elizabeth, may I ask you a very simple clarifying question? Yeah. So uh, suppose BJ is of demand type D, and mm -hmm. take any superset of D and call it a D prime. D prime yes. is a superset of D. So then VJ is also of demand type D prime. Precisely. So, that so, is a. So are, are you, my question is vague, but are, are you looking at some kind of minimal? Uh, um, we, we, we're not actually necessarily restricting to being of the minimal mm. demand type. And the reason for that is that we want to correspond to the sort of economic characterizations oh, um, that already exist. So, for example, oh. an, an additively separable valuation uh, mm. that would um, additively separable valuation would look like that, for example. So that is of the strong substitutes demand type. It doesn't it doesn't have the minus one one vector in it but it is uh, in economic terms, a strong substitutes valuation. So we want to say that that is of the strong substitutes demand type, even though the strong substitute set of vectors isn't the minimal set of vectors that you can use to characterize it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that, that's, a, that's a very good uh, subtle point worth clarifying. So we're not insisting on the minimal one deliberately. So basically you focus uh, on such D uh, mm -hmm. which allows natural economic interpretation. Uh, to, I mean, to start with, to, uh, we, we are motivated to start with by saying, for example, such D as strong substitutes will work with a natural economic motivation. But what we, what we, where we hope to go with that is to say, well, actually, other sets of vectors work too, and maybe we can come back to these and think of a natural economic interpretation that went with them as well. So we don't want to be restricted by the natural economic sets that had previously okay. been written down, but we do want to correspond in a, in a sensible way to the ones that had been. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry, can I, uh, mm -hmm. uh, could you show the uh, definition of demand type again? Sorry, I'm kind of slow. Um, of course. So uh, evaluation is of a demand type if every facet has normal in that demand type. So uh, we've got our valuation. We know that corresponds to a lip. We know the building blocks of the lip are the facets. What are their normal vectors? Those, take those as primitive integer vectors. If those fall within the set D, which is a set of vectors, then it's of that demand type. See, I see. So somehow I was, uh, I was not totally sure which part is the most non-trivial part of the uh, final lemma given this definition. So I would have thought that the, um, some uh, the normal uh, in this uh, facet uh, mm -hmm. sort of corresponded to the change in demand when you. Yeah when you change the price in, in the price space. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, if you, you, you post the change in the demand. So uh, in the lemma, that seemed to be what you were saying. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, so could, could you sort of describe which part is uh, um, most um, sort of uh, non-trivial part of the lemma uh, apart from the, uh, given the definition? Oh, why? Why is this non-trivial? You're asking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I maybe, I, uh, surely, I'm missing uh, something in the. So I wasn't sure if. Uh, um... So here in this slide, I have been assuming you only cross one facet. I've been saying let's start with a simple case where you only cross one facet, and then see how it goes. Mm -hmm. In this theorem. I'm not assuming that you only cross one facet. We're assuming instead that you've only got one unit of each good. 
And in fact, what's underlying this theorem is that if you've only got one unit of each good, then you will only cross one facet. Oh, oh, I see, I see. So you can you can think about with with this additively separable picture I drew that if, if that's mm. the if that's the lip, and then I think about a change in demand, I could I could do a change in demand like that oh, across two facets. Uh, but I'm I'm not looking at that sort of change in this in this uh, theorem because I'm only looking at changing one good at once. And you might say, uh -huh. well, how about it's that right. one? That's well, right. that one, that one, it would break for, but that one can't then have this property. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So now, now I find, <laughs> sorry, I, I've been very slow. I was, I so, was so yeah, I, I, no, I, I see your point that this uh, does seem to be saying sort of the same thing as the previous slide, but the previous slide had a restriction and here effectively we put that restriction differently. But that's a really, that's a really good point and worth, worth okay, thinking about you. for no, presenting I, this I, result again, as this is a new result. So thank I, you for I that. See. I see. Oh, this is really nice. Thank you. Yeah, now now I see the whole picture, uh, including the uh, where where I was really stopping. So thank you. Great. No, thank you. So that that uh, indeed, as discussed, is the case when there's only one unit of each good. Uh, we don't want to be that specific. We want to be more general than that. So uh, what's the result we can come up with in general? This this again doesn't have perfect generality. This is assuming that we've got a finite set of vectors in our defining our demand type and uh, we can move over to infinite vectors but that's perhaps not worth the, the additional detail in this talk because i'm hoping to get on with the auctions as well so let's suppose that we are talking about a finite set of vectors then evaluation is of a demand type if and only if think about two prices and the bundles that are uniquely demanded at those prices then the change in demand has got to be a non-negative linear combination. So it's got to be a combination of elements of the set D of vectors, but more specifically, the elements of that set D of vectors that satisfy the law, law of demand, because we're changing in demand from P to P prime. So we're going to effectively be taking a series of steps and at each of those steps, the law of demand must be satisfied. So a way to think about this going back to this picture is just, I'm making a change like that. And so I do a series of steps like that. And so this shows us that yes, for any pair of prices, it's not necessarily going to be just a demand type vector, but it's gonna be a combination of demand type vectors. So the changes in demand actually break down as the demand type vectors. They give us the way of thinking about and slipping them together. And then you can think about well, well question. this looks like the law of demand. So what, what's you know x minus x times p minus p should be that. yes. That's the law of demand. That's the law of demand. So that that must hold. So every step, if 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 we think about it in terms of this change of price. The, the, yeah, that's exactly the way to think about it. We're changing price, and so we're crossing a series of facets effectively. And uh, at each time we cross a facet, the law of demand must hold, and we're also playing facet normal times weight equals change in demand. So effectively, we're just doing that repeatedly. Uh -huh. Now there's a little bit more subtlety to it because now we're looking at any changes in prices. So we oh, could see. also do Overlap. that yeah. or something. I see. And so then, then there is a little bit more to understand, or, yeah. or maybe maybe this. Yeah. Uh, and so it works for those as well, but the intuition is the one where it's just the same. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that's that's what a demand type is. It's a new way of categorizing valuations, which we hope slots very neatly with existing ways of categorizing valuations but also they're categorized by a collection of vectors and collections of vectors are easier for mathematicians to work with than the sort of way economists are used to writing down valuations and so this is why we can then go further with them uh, right so uh, next i was going to talk a little bit about duality in in uh, in our framework i've just noticed the time 
oh, well, I will continue going at this pace and we'll see where we get to. Um, so we, we, we recall that our lip lives in price space. And we recall that I said at the beginning that uh, quantity space, I'm going to draw upside down and back to front. Now we're really going to see why I draw quantity space upside down and back to front, because we're going to also define a, a complex on quantity space. This is going to be the collection of cells that are the convex hull of the demand set at some price. So let's unpack that. If we think about the, the price that I've highlighted with a green star here, at that price, I would demand nothing or one good or the other good. So the convex hull of those possible demands is the green triangle, given the way around I've drawn the axes. The convex hull of the orange star price is the orange triangle. So they correspond like that. If I think about prices on, for example, the green line, on those prices, I'm indifferent between nothing and one unit of good two. So that corresponds to the convex hull of the two bundles that I've joined up with the green line. And I think in this particular picture, you can really see why I draw the quantity axes upside down and back to front, because they correspond, map across nicely visually. You can see exactly what's going on with the correspondence there, because of course, higher prices mean lower demand. So that's why it's flipped around. And we can see what's going on with this duality is that if we've got K dimensional pieces on one side, then we've got N minus K dimensional pieces on the other side. So here we've got zero dimensional bits in price space. So we've got two dimensional bits in quantity space. Here it's one and one. And we also notice here that they're, they're orthogonal to each other. And that's because facet normal equals change in demand. So of course they're orthogonal to one another. And we can go up and say, OK, and then the two dimensional bits in price space, those are going to correspond to zero dimensional bits in quantity space. Those correspond to the dots. So that's all happy. And that's lined up the right way around because I drew my picture up further down and back to front. So we can see that we can draw this picture, which is the demand complex, the slicing up of the convex hull of demand set in this way. And it corresponds in a very nice way with the lip that we've been drawing. We should notice that there's redundancy. It also corresponds with this lip, for example, or with this lip. There's nothing specific about where things are in price space and exactly how long the edges are. So we would say that these lips, because they correspond to the same demand complex, we call these, we say these have the same combinatorial type. And so that's a, a stricter condition than being of the same demand type. Not only are the trade-offs the same, but actually the whole combination of things that you might demand together are the same. In the same way, the, the, the Alex and Elizabeth valuations that I was drawing at the beginning, they aren't just of the same demand type, they're also of the same combinatorial type. So this is a finer way to think about categorizing valuations. But that's a, a bit of an aside. We can draw that one then. We can draw, we can draw the complements one uh, that we've mentioned before. But let us focus in, so, oh yes, there's some colors. Let's focus on this one. And this one, you will notice, you will notice the price space picture uh, is the sort of picture that Alex was drawing yesterday where we've got a complements person and a substitutes person. And the demand complex, we can uh, correspond the lines in the nice way, but we've actually now got a question because what's happened to this bundle in the middle here? That's not a vertex. So it's not actually a cell of the demand complex. So it doesn't correspond to one of the two dimensional regions in price space. So what's going on there? Is that demanded? It lives in the two dimensional price space. Uh, sorry, it lives in the two dimensional quantity space region that it's, it's sitting in the middle of. And so that geometrically tells us that it actually corresponds to the price corresponding to that bit in the middle of the picture, the yellow price in the middle of the picture, that's where that bundle corresponds. It doesn't correspond to a nice open region. It just corresponds to a single point together with the other one, the other uh, quantities around it. So we actually are able to see that bundles only possibly demanded that price is corresponding to the demand complex cell that they're in. So this bundle, if it's demanded, can only be demanded at that price exactly there. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, 
we've got pri a price at which we're indifferent between all the bundles at the vertices of that square. And so it must be that at least looking at the vertices, that the, price, that, that the valuation is increasing linearly across that space because there's a price at which we're indifferent between all of them. And so if that linear increase in value across the space also maps precisely to the one in the middle there, then it'll be demanded there. Drawing the value function here, or just as the, the profit function as we were discussing before, we can see that everything is demanded. There's a nice indifference between all of them if everything increases linearly all across. But if, if that bundle in the middle is worth less than that, if it's worth 2.5, for example, then instead of that value of that bundle in the middle reaching the nice smooth increase in values of everything else around it, it's worth less than that, but you don't demand it. You were going to ask a question. Okay, so uh, um, I, have, I have a comment Go going back to my production function example. Mm -hmm. So um, suppose you have two uh, uh, firms from A and mm -hmm. B and their production function look very nice. L looks like a convex uh, concave function in, in this mm -hmm. deep sense. But now suppose uh, uh, a single uh, firm owns uh, those two firms. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I have a single firm uh, which has factory A and factory B. And uh, what we have here is the production function of the new gigantic firm, which has factory mm -hmm. A and B. And this is a picture of production function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this firm has two factories. Each factory looks like nice concave thing, mm -hmm. but the aggregate you know, production function fails to be concave. This in, is exactly in, where we're going. Yeah. This, this so, is exactly so, where so, we're so going. My question is, uh, in continuous case, if mm -hmm. you have two production sets, two graphs of, you, you know, graph of factory A production mm -hmm. function and graph of factory B production function, those, those two things are convex. Mm -hmm. And if you sum up those two sets, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, we have the definition of summation of sets. So set of two convex set is also convex in continuous yes. case. Yes. But uh, this suggests that the discrete case, it's not automatic. Precisely. And, uh, I think what you are doing here is to come up with a condition uh, to ensure that uh, two discrete convex, summation of two discrete con convex set is also convex in, in such Precisely. Case. Okay. Yes, Good. that's that's absolutely right. Yes. 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 So that's that in fact is the intuition uh, and the sort of starting point of thinking about it taken taken by uh, Danilov Koshevoy and Marota when they were thinking about these issues, who I will mention when I've got to the theorem. But that, that is exactly where we're going. Okay. So good. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, so um, we agree that the this bundle in the middle here, it's only going to be demanded if the thing happens to be nicely behaved, nice and linear across this, this square, uh, this, this region in the demand set it's in. And so in this particular case, it isn't. And that tells us that the demand set at this price is not what we call discrete convex. So discrete convex is just what you would think it would be if you tried to define convexity in a discrete setting. A set is discrete convex if when you take its convex hull and then just look at the integer points, that's what we started with. So this, this red set isn't. Uh, so that, that set's not discrete convex and that corresponds exactly to the valuation uh, that we're plotting here, failing to be concave. So a valuation would be concave if we can dis extend it to a weakly concave function across the convex hull of its domain. And this one clearly we can't uh, because that bundle in the middle has too low a value. And so and this, this lemma is exactly the analog of what you see in the continuous case, that every bundle in the domain or in the discrete convex hull of the domain is going to be demanded, if and only if that valuation is concave. And that's going to hold, if and only if the demand set is discrete convex at all prices. So that's relationship between demanding a bundle and what happens at every individual price. And that's important because we're going to exactly as was just 
perfectly foreshadowed, we're going to come to that when we start aggregating valuations. So now we remember we have many agents, J, J and capital J, and they each have a valuation and they, they each have a separate domain and we will define X uh, without a, I suppose, I thought, sorry, this is my quick adaptation of Alex's notation. Maybe I should have called that X capital J, but I didn't. Sorry about that, Alex. Uh, so uh, we want then to think about what the aggregate demand is. Well, the aggregate demand set is just the Minkowski sum of the individual demands, the, the setwise sum. And that is equal to the demand set corresponding to some valuation capital J, where what is this valuation capital J? We can write down what that is in terms of it being the maximum way of putting together the uh, bundles uh, from the individual perspective, uh, such uh, uh, adding up those values in, 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 in the best possible way of distributing them across people. So we, I could say that that is what the aggregate valuation is, but I'm not going to bother because as I mentioned, I am interested in drawing squibbly pictures, not in thinking about precisely what valuations are. And so I find it easier not to think about that because as it turns out, I never need to know that. So evaluation is just a function on this aggregate domain. And uh, then competitive equilibrium. Alex defined yesterday in an exchange economy. In this paper, we didn't work in exchange economies. And I have uh, considered it would just confuse me and perhaps people who went across to look at the paper if I tried to rewrite this talk in the context of exchange economies. So I, I am not going to work in exchange economies. We have an external supply, you might say, and then a competitive equilibrium among agents consists of allocations for each individual agent that add up to that external supply and a price that means that each agent does indeed demand at that price, whatever it is we've allocated them, and if we think about it, these two conditions just say that the external supply is equal to the aggregate demand at that price. To translate that to, to, to Alex's version from yesterday, this is the same as a competitive equilibrium and exchange economy if X is equal to zero. And X could be equal to zero, the external supply could be equal to zero, because you may have noticed right at the beginning I didn't insist that the bundles being demanded, the, the, the domains for each individual agent, were positive integer. They can be negative integer. And if you're demanding a negative integer bundle, that just means you want to sell instead of wanting to buy. So I could have someone demanding negative integer bundles and someone demanding positive integer bundles. And indeed, I can have someone who sometimes demands positive and sometimes demands negative. And maybe they're negative in one good only if they're positive in the other good, because that's their input and that's their output. And I can put all of these together and say it's an exchange economy. And so the external supply is zero. So then, then this corresponds to Alex's definition. Otherwise, I could just include an additional agent who demands minus X, and then I would get back to the exchange economy because then in order to get zero, uh, everyone else would have to uh, demand something adding up to plus X. Anyway, I will now uh, stop talking about exchange economies and go back to talking about things the way we wrote them in this paper. Uh, and we see then the competitive equilibrium done in this way with an external supply, that there exists an equilibrium for every possible external supply, if and only if that, oh, I'm sorry, this is a tiny bit of notation I failed to change to Alex's formulation, if and only if VJ, sorry, is that invisible there? VJ, our aggregate valuation is concave. So you might say, okay, now you need to know what VJ is. But that holds if and only if the demand set is discrete convex for all prices. This is exactly the lemma that we had on the previous slide, just now applied to the aggregate case. So I thought for a moment I might need to know about the aggregate valuation, but no, I need to know about the demand set at every price, the aggregate demand set at every price, and whether that's discrete convex or not. And so that's the way I'm going to think about it, because for me, and I think also for Paul, this is just so much easier to think about. Uh, and so we're, we only ask the question about bundles in the convex hull of, oh dear, these should be X's. I, maybe it was a mistake to try and change the consistent notation with Alex. 
don't think there's too many, been too many mistakes up to this point. We will, this, so this is of course the aggregate domain here that I'm talking about here. We call supplies in this set relevant. So if a bundle is outside the convex hull of the aggregate domain, clearly it's not going to be demanded. So these are the ones that are relevant to ask the question about. What does the lip of aggregate demand look like? Well, I've got two individual lips and we remember the lip is the locus of indifference prices. So where is the aggregate indifferent? Well, between two bundles, well, one of the individual agents had better be indifferent between two bundles. So we just superimpose them, just draw them on top of each other. That gives us the aggregate lip. And we note in passing, having drawn that, that it follows immediately that if the individual valuations are of any demand type, then so is their aggregate. Because their aggregate is just the superposition of their individual ones. So the facet normals better be the facet normals of the individual ones. So that, that shows us without doing any work at all, that for example, if all our individual valuations are strong substitutes, then so is our aggregate one. How about those demand sets though? That was what I wanted to know about. Uh, what is the aggregate demand set at a price? So for those prices that aren't on the aggregate lip, it's easy. We can start with presumably sufficiently high prices, give us demand of zero, and then use facet normal times weight equals change in demand. And if a price is on the aggregate lip, but it's only on one of the individual lips, and if we've assumed that the individual valuations are concave, then that's also easy because it's just the convex hull of what's demanded nearby. So the only possible interesting case is when the price is on more than one individual lip. So here we come to the point that Alex mentioned, that the interesting things are the intersections. If individual valuations are concave, that equilibrium is only going to fail if this aggregate demand set is not discrete convex at some price in the intersection. So now I wanted a property that held for all prices and I've narrowed it down to, I only care about prices in the intersection. Okay. And so now we need to think about what could happen at this intersection and what it is in fact that goes wrong at this specific intersection that we've been drawing as an example through this talk. The classic theorems of competitive equilibrium tend to have this sort of form. You, you suppose you have a domain for all agents. So in Kelso and Crawford, uh, the agents uh, would have one unit of each good. It's slightly more complicated than this because you have workers and firms in their setting, but let's take a simplified version of Kelso and Crawford. And then you assume that uh, all the valuations have a property such as, for example, being substitutes and supply is from a certain relevant set. And then you say, okay, competitive equilibrium exists. So that's the Kelso Crawford result. You've got the Milgram Strudovici result, which allows bigger domains and insists on concave strong substitute valuations for all agents and a supply that seems like a relevant sort of set. And uh, then you've got the Hatfield, Commoners, Nishapur, Ostrovsky, and Westcamp paper which has the, the full substitutes. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we assume a domain, we assume some sort of property, we have a supply that seems the right sort of size, and then we get a competitive equilibrium. So we're trying to generalize results like that. So we want to fix the description and say agents have concave valuations of this description and supply is in the domain of their aggregate demands and ask, is competitive equilibrium guaranteed? And when I say a description, Obviously, I'm going to mean a demand type. And so the question, does competitive equilibrium always exist, is going to depend on the properties of the vectors demanding, defining that demand type. So our demand type, our set of valuations, is characterized for us by a set of vectors, set of primitive integer vectors. And we're going to ask about the properties of those primitive integer vectors to see whether equilibrium is guaranteed. And so Here's the, the case we've been talking about. And exactly as was said, the question is, is the demand at this price, aggregate demand at this price, discrete convex? Well, let's think about it. At this price, the red agent, the substitute agent, demands one zero or zero one. And the blue agent, the complements agent, demands one one or zero zero. 
And so there are only four ways to put together those two by two possibilities. If you've got two people and each one's got two possibilities, then that can only go together as four. And we can also look at the picture and the way I've drawn it, that as uh, uh, the vertices of this thing correspond to the areas around the lip, and as I move between two of these vertices, that's crossing one of the facets of the lip. So that's embodying the change in demand of the red agent there. And so I can move between the vertices perfectly happily. I can't go to the middle. I can't get there. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's not in the set of things that I can get at. There is no way to make a change by making changes from these individual agents to get to the bundle in the middle. Now, if you have divisibility, then there would be because you would be able to go halfway according to one of these changes and then halfway according to the other change. And so you would basically be saying, let me give half, a, half of good one and half of good two to the complements agent and half of good one and half of good two to the substitutes agent. And they will be happy with that. That would be fine. But we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that suggests that if, uh, if we re replicate this economy. So you have uh, many red guys and mm -hmm. many blue guys. Then, you, you know, uh, you can approximate the middle uh, black point. Yes, right? yes, exactly. If, so, if... Do you have any general results saying that if you replicate, you know, economy many, many times, uh, maybe you don't get exact uh, middle black point, but uh, it's it's uh, approximated, right? Um, so big economy we, solves, you know, if, even if everything is discrete, there if there are many similar types, then we do get the equilibrium existence, something like this. Yes. So we don't have the result written down for that because somebody else does. Ah. And I am now going to hopefully defer to Alex to maybe be able to answer that question. Okay. Um, if he can pop up in the questions and remind me who it is who has that paper. Um, I, I, I think the results of that kind started with as far back as um, I think SCARF 67 actually that gave oh, results see. of this kind. So I don't think it needs any of the um, tools that Elizabeth has been developing. I think oh, there I are see. general results about general large, uh -huh. exactly, sort of discrete economies which are large um, and and yeah, so um, I see. that's all. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alex. It is it is excellent to have a co-author with a more functioning memory of the literature than I do on hand to take these questions. Uh, right, so we had agreed that in this case, with this indivisibility, we weren't going to get to the bundle in the middle. So no, we can't do that. So looking at this picture again, what's the issue? The issue is that there's a bundle in this square that's not at a vertex, because we saw that we could move between the vertices and that was fine, but we can't get away from the vertices. So why do we have a bundle in the middle of this square that's not a vertex? Well, actually it's because the area of the square is two. And if you, if you haven't come across this result before, you can, play with some doodles on a piece of paper and convince yourself that in fact, the area of a square like this or a parallel pipette in general, uh, you're, you're going to have, if, if the area is N, then you're going to have N minus one bundles in the middle. So if the area is one, then you're fine. But if the area is two, then there's a bundle in the middle. If there's an area is three, then there's two bundles in the middle, etc. So there exists a bundle there because the square's area is greater than one. And that area we can calculate as the determinant of the vectors along its edges. That's again a geometric fact that you may have come across before or not. In this case, we're taking the determinant of one, one and minus one, one, that's two. So we will have avoid problems if when we take the determinant of vectors along the edges in this sort of situation, we don't get numbers bigger than one or less than minus one. But we remember that the edges in the demand complex pictures are precisely the facet normal in the lip pictures. So these edge vectors are the demand type vectors. So if we take a set of n demand type vectors, stick them together and say, here's a square matrix, take the determinant of that, is that plus or minus one or zero? 
or not? If the answer is yes, it is, then we don't have this problem and we're going to get competitive equilibria. That property of vectors is a perfectly well-known property in the mathematical literature. It's called unimodularity. So this is why the result we call the unimodularity theorem. It's because we have vectors that we're asking, do they have this mathematical property? And this mathematical property is perfectly straightforward to check. Just take sets of them, stick them all together. Do you always get plus or minus one or zero or not? There's a slight caveat here that if you always actually get zero, if the set of vectors are, uh, are not big enough in a sense, uh, then you would need to say, do there exist, does there exist an extension such that you would always get plus or minus one or zero. But, um, let's not worry about that too much right now. So then the unimodularity theorem is as follows. Fix a set of uh, uh, vectors. Uh, competitive equilibrium exists for every finite set of agents with concave valuations of this type and all relevant supply bundles if and only if that set of vectors is unimodular. And we've, we've thought about how to look at that when we've got intersections that line up beautifully. There is a little bit more to the proof because the intersections between the lips might not line up in the nice, uh, what we call transverse way that I've been drawing so far. So there's a bit more to the proof than, than, than the motivation of the proof we've seen at this point. But this is really the, the, the idea of the proof that we've seen. And we can also show, we, we didn't think about this, Paul and I, when we were thinking about this paper. But of course, as we saw with Alex yesterday, there's a really important question of whether you've got maximal domains of valuations that equilibrium exists for. And so we can also show that if our set D is a maximal unimodular set of vectors, then it defines a maximal domain of valuation such that equilibrium exists. So for example, the strong substitute vectors, they are the maximal unimodular set of vectors. So that means that if you've got a valuation that's not of that demand type, then there exist valuations that are of that demand type such that competitive equilibrium fails. And we can play that game for any maximal unimodular set of vectors. And of course, the, the punchline is going to be that the strong substitute demand type vectors, they are a unimodular set of vectors, they are a maximal unimodular set of vectors, but they're not the only one. Anyway, from, from this theorem follows all the sort of results I was alluding to before. They're all instances of this theorem because they all correspond to unimodular sets of vectors. But there's also, um, uh, I should uh, confess at this point, that this result is mathematically effectively equivalent uh, to one that was previously known, uh, Danilov, Koshevoy and Marota's beautiful 2001 paper that far too few people have read. And if you're very interested in these ideas, I would encourage you to have a look at that wonderful piece of work uh, that because too few people had read it, these ideas hadn't come through. But I should also say that the way they put it, it is much less clear what that has to do with these four results above than, um, than I think the way we put it. So I wouldn't, for example, be criticizing uh, the papers that uh, were published after that paper for not seeing that their result followed for that from that paper, because really there would have been a lot of work to do to see that their results did follow from that paper. So our, 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 our result is mathematically equivalent to theirs, but, but perhaps slightly non-trivially, at least in terms of understanding what's going on economically. Uh, yes, so. This, this theorem was not quite as original to us as perhaps it could have been, but, but uh, nonetheless, I think understanding quite how this slots in with economics is, is really our contribution. So an example is strong substitutes. Here are the strong substitute vectors. Here's the example. Equilibrium always exists. And uh, so in fact, all the models I've been talking about are examples of this. The model of Sun and Yang that Alex talked about yesterday is a basis change of this. So to think about that, here's the three-dimensional case. We just divide up the goods and we'd say tables are above the line and chairs below the line. And so we just multiply everything below the line by minus one, for example. So that will become a minus, that will become a plus, and that will become a plus. That's just a basis change. And so if it works, if it works for the strong substitute vectors, it works for the basis change of the strong substitute vectors. But you don't have to restrict yourself to strong substitutes. 
you do oh, in time. Wait, I can, uh, could, you, mm -hmm. could you explain that again? So how do you, uh, so, uh, uh, so it seems that you are saying that the, um, checking that the, um, like the case of call for another. So if you have this strong substitute, so it's easy to check that uh, this unimodularity condition is uh, satisfied. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. So uh, these these sets of uh, this set of vectors. Uh, so the set of vectors where you have at most one plus one, at most one minus one, and all other zero. Uh, that being a unimodular set. Uh, so that's actually called the Poincaré set of vectors, um, and it's been known since 1900 that that's unimodular. And uh, there's there's quite a nice way to check that in terms of. Actually, I'm I'm running so over. Maybe I won't tell you how to check those vectors okay. either modular, okay. but it's um okay. it's it's a nice back of the envelope exercise for next time you're bored. <laughs> okay, okay. And for the other next one, so you're saying that the base change thing. So you're are you the basis that? change? So yeah. this is just uh if if I effectively I effectively I've multiplied this matrix by one one minus one. So if I if I multiply by that, then the bottom row all gets multiplied by a minus one. I see. Um, but if 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 I had the unimodularity property before, and I multiply by that matrix, I then I will have the unimodularity property. The property will be preserved by this kind of the unimodularity property. Will be preserved by that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Very nice. So that's strong substitutes, uh, and for n less than or equal to three, uh, for less than less than or equal to three goods. That's all there is uh, up to basis change. Uh, but when we've got four goods, uh, that is not necessarily the case. And in fact, what's rather interesting, uh, this is another result of uh, Vladimir Danilov with uh, another co author, Koshenkin. In fact, all unimodular demand types are a basis change of a purely complements demand type. So the idea that substitutes are fundamental for equilibrium is really in this sense misplaced because all demand types, all sets of valuations characterized in this way for which equilibrium is guaranteed are actually a basis change of a complements one and they're not all a basis change of a substitutes one. So here is an example of a complements one. Uh, we've got, uh, so the demand type vectors are going to be the columns of this matrix and the rows we think about as being the goods and here I'm thinking about these goods as corresponding to um, people I might hire in my firm. So this also has a link to coalition formation then. So I might hire in my firm frontline workers of category one, two, or three. And we can see here that frontline workers one, two, and three are useful on their own. We don't have the fourth uh, potential team member as being any use on their own. They're a manager. You don't want a manager on their own. That's not going to achieve anything in your firm. But you might want a frontline worker and a manager because then they might work better. And we also have a complementarity between a frontline worker and another frontline worker only if the manager is present. So uh, this is an example of what I was saying that rather than starting with uh, uh, economically understood character characterization of preferences, and turning that into vectors. Here I've started with something that does work with the vectors and said, is there an economic interpretation of this? But maybe there is. Maybe there is in this case. Anyway, in this, this case is unimodular. So for this case, competitive equilibrium is guaranteed. Or if we're thinking about this in terms of coalition formation, then the, the matching does exist for this case. I am supposed to be finishing now, and I haven't even started on the uh, product mix auction. So I am going to jump over the intersection count theorem, unfortunately, uh, and uh, move on to a little bit of product mix auction, and uh, then I will open questions. Sorry about my timekeeping being terrible. I've just had so many wonderful questions from you all as I go along that you've encouraged me to go slowly and into more detail than perhaps I had time for. So, as I said, product makes auctions are, we are thinking about how to address real world situations in which auction designs are needed. And we're going to think about those auction designs using these geometric tools. And the fundamental problem, the, sorry, the, the first problem was the Bank of England problem where they spoke to Paul, this was before I was involved. 
uh, that the Bank of England wanted to loan funds to banks during the financial crisis. It was needs to loan them against collateral, of course, but banks had run out of decent collateral, so it wanted to take less good than usual collateral. But obviously, you've got considerations why you would want to do that only in return for higher interest rate. The question is, how much higher should that interest rate be? How much more funds should you loan against the lower collateral compared with the, compared with the higher collateral? What should these trade-offs be? The Bank of England didn't precisely know the answers to these questions. And really, it wanted the answers to these questions to emerge from a market rather than them specifying. So that's, that's the first problem. I think I'm not going to have time to talk about the Iceland problem at all. So the general problem is that the seller wants to sell multiple versions of a product, so multiple goods, and the costs depend on the bundle of goods sold. So the preferred bundle to sell depends on the prices of all goods, and the bidder's demand similarly depends on the prices of all goods. And also we're assuming that there is some reason to, to prefer a sealed bid mechanism. So in these financial settings, that's clear. You wouldn't want to run a procedure that took a finite amount of time if there were interactions with financial markets, that would that would lead to stability, instabilities and problems. So you want a simple, simple, still bid mechanism if you're talking about central banking auction. We're hoping to use ideas that we've been working on more recently with Alex and Ravi to think about these uh, questions in terms of income effects as well. And as, as Alex has, has uh, been talking about, you can't necessarily use the sort of to tone mechanisms that you would uh, have used in the transferable utility substitutes world when you have income effects. But these sorts of uh, methods might still work as, uh, there, uh, despite the lack of vertitomon. So either we want a sealed bid mechanism because there's actually a, a very good external reason to want one because we're talking about a financial crisis, or we might want to extend these methods in settings in which we think sealed bid mechanisms might work but we don't think that a tone want uh, alliterative approach is going to work. A dynamic auction seems unlikely to work in some settings where a steel bid auction might. So let me skip on rapidly to drawing you some pictures. As that is that is my, my uh, theme today. Bank of England uh, gathers information in terms of dot bids. So a dot bid represents a valuation which looks like this, whose lip looks like this. This is a bid for at most one unit, and at a particular specified price, that's where we're indifferent between having the first good and the second good and nothing. And so this, from the point of view of now understanding what lips are, what this valuation is should be perfectly clear. And we will demand the good which is best relative to the price at which the dot has been drawn. So this, we hope, is easy to understand. And we associate this with a lip, where the bidder is different between nothing uh, and something, or alternatively between good I and good J. And that's a, a three-dimensional version of a Bank of England dot bid. And we can see that given a price, we can see what to do with this bid. If the price is uh, too high, then we'll reject the bid. So in fact, we can draw lines there and say that if the, if the bid is in that box relative to the price, it's definitely going to be rejected. If the bid falls outside the box, and it's clearly outside the box because it's a, a good bid on, on uh, the first uh, price, um, then, then we'll accept it on the first good. And so we can also draw another 45 degree line there and say that the bids that are on that side of the 45 degree line are accepted on the first good, the bids that are on the other side are accepted on the second good. So you can see that you can draw these three lines associated with the auction and look at where the dots are relative to those lines and see immediately what the demand is. So it's very easy to aggregate these bids. Aggregate demand is easy to find and it's easy to optimize. We can think about an individual bid being uh, corresponding to a linear program and we can aggregate these linear programs just by adding them up. So that's the Bank of England's approach. And so with the Bank of England's approach, we can depict any valuation that looks like this in any dimension, this sort of thing. But we've been talking a lot about strong substitutes. And although I've emphasized that strong substitutes aren't the only case in which competitive equilibrium is guaranteed, they are nonetheless a really important case. And if we're drawing things that looks like this, it seems that we think 
that our, our bidders have a strong substitute preference between the goods. So they see the goods as substitutes and moreover, the trade-offs between the goods are one-to-one. -one. So it would be perfectly reasonable if this was the bidder's preference. This is another strong substitute slip, corresponds to a strong substitute's valuation, which in accordance with my general philosophy, I have not worked out. But we can't draw this slip yet with the product mix auction bids. Suppose we try to, we might say, well, we could put product mix auction bids at those points. That would seem sensible. You see, it, it, it doesn't match up right. There's this extra bit. Then we can, we can look harder at that extra bit and say, that looks like a product mix auction bid again. So I put another product mix auction bid there, but have it be negative in a sense, then that works. So the question is, what does that mean? Does that always work? And what does that even mean if I do it like that? And this takes us then from the original Bank of England language to the strong substitute bidding language. We want to still find a way to aggr understand, aggregate, and optimize these this, uh, auctions with this bidding language, introducing these negative dots in some way. Perhaps it's not going to be as easy as before, but the payoff is going to be that we can depict all preferences for strong substitutes using this bidding language. And sorry, galloping along and only going to the bits I really want to talk about. So to understand how to do the negative bids, let's think again about the positive bids. If I've got a collection of positive bids, that corresponds to an aggregate valuation across all those bids. That corresponds to a lip, which is whose, whose set is the union of those lips. And the weights are the number of dot bids associated with each facet. So we see that on the, on the facet that, where I've labeled two, you've got the red, lip, the red dot and the blue dot have both given rise to a facet that line up there. So that one has weight two. So we have a sense of addition of lips from dot bids. And the addition is that we take their union and then we add up the weights on the facets, if facets come from more than one lip in the first place. So that should be fine, given all we've seen before. So that's addition. Now we can do subtraction. So suppose we're asking ourselves, can I subtract one lip from another? Well, first I'm going to take the union, then I'm going to subtract the weights. So now I've got some things with a weight of minus one and a weight of zero. Those didn't exist in the first half of the talk, right? All weights were positive because facet normal times weight gives a change in demand. And if you've got a negative number there, then you're gonna break that law of demand. And if you've got a zero there, then you've got no change in demand. So you wouldn't have, have a facet like that. So let's get rid of that facet that's zero weighted because there's no change in demand there. We still got these minus one weighted ones, so that's odd. But it is still balanced. We've still got that property that if you go round in a circle, facet normal times weight equals change in demand, going round in a circle and round in a circle, it does still add up to zero. So that balancing property still holds. It's just that sometimes we've got these negative bits which might not behave. But suppose we didn't have any negative bits. Suppose when we'd done this, we'd lined it up nicely in the first place, and so all the weights were positive, then we've got a positive, or at least uh, that we, we might have zero on some facets, but just throw them away and delete them. Then we'd have positive weights on all facets and we'd have the balancing property and we would in fact have a polyhedral complex. And so remembering back to the beginning of the talk and evaluation complex equivalence theorem, we have got the lip of some valuation. And moreover, it's going to be a substitutes valuation. So here's an example where it does work. If this is my first lip that I draw, and then I subtract that lip, then that's okay. I've put a zero weight. I just delete the zero weighted facets. I've got something that's now got positive weights everywhere. I've got the lip of evaluation. So given positive dots and negative dots, I'm going to define the lip corresponding to the positive ones minus the negative ones in this way, just following the procedure above. And I'm going to say that the dots that I started with are a valid collection in the first place. 
if I do indeed end up with a non-negative weight everywhere. And because at the individual level, all of these are strong substitutes, the, well, the lip you get from a single dot is a strong substitute lip, and we've just put facets together from individual things, so we haven't got any new facets, so all the facet normals are strong substitute normals, we have got a strong substitute valuation here. So if we have a collection of positive and negative dots that's valid, then we do get a strong substitute valuation. And of course, the, the punchline is going to be that we can get all of them that way. How do we think about demand from this? So this whole procedure tells us by the valuation complex equivalence theorem that a valuation exists. Finding that valuation may be hard work. But well, we don't need to, we care about demand sets, we don't care about valuations. So how do we can translate that into demand sets? Well, it's perfectly straightforward when demand is unique. It's the demand corresponding to the positive ones minus the demand corresponding to the set that we're going to call the negative ones. So for example, here, uh, I can say, I've got a negative one at the middle here, that's an S one. So I'm going to take it away again. So I've got three dots that I've accepted on good one, but one of those is negative, so I take that away. So I've got a total demand of one unit of good one here. And for the uh, prices at which uh, demand is non-unique, you just take the convex hull of prices nearby. So the representation theorem then is that, let's suppose that we start with uh, a nice domain of evaluation, or what we call a simplex, which just has this form, it's, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, 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 the number of, of uh, units of each good is less than or equal to D for some D. So that gives you a simplex with edges of less length D. Let's suppose we are of that form. Then evaluation is a strong substitute valuation if and only if it can be presented using a valid collection of positive and negative dot bits. And I'm going to give you a tiny sense of the proof of that. And then, Fajito, I will stop. And I do apologize for overrunning. So I would like to give you a tiny sense of this because I think this is rather fun. So here is, here is a, uh, a strong substitute slip that I want to draw. So let me try to draw it. I can identify minimal points on the horizontal and vertical facets. And if I put bids in there, then in fact, I'll cover it. So I'll have got all of the lip in the thing that I've drawn with those dots. So if I've got all of the lip in the thing that I've drawn with those dots, then when I subtract the thing that I started with, I've got a new lip, which is still a strong substitute lip. So I can do that again. And I just keep doing that and it terminates. And we can see that this will terminate because we can identify a finite set of points at which we might ever put a bid. And we can see that the minimal point at which we put a bid at any stage is strictly increasing. So basically we can't, we can't go into an infinite loop here. Eventually we're going to have to stop. And so if we stop, then we say, well, the, the, the bids I put in at the first stage are positive. The bids I put in at the second stage are negative. And in higher dimensions, there will be a, a sort of double negative, which turns into positive again, and uh, just keep doing as many times as I need, and the sign alternates each time, and that gives me my positive and negative bits. So, uh, jumping to the summary then, we can approach auction design using bidding languages when we want sealed bid auctions simultaneously selling multiple goods, and we can design these using geometry, and we have a a selection of bidding languages of which I've only unfortunately had the time to give you a flavor of one of them. And the point uh, that I would emphasize here is that this is an application of our earlier work with geometry of, on the geometry of preferences. And really you need to know that what we, what we were doing there in terms of the geometry of preferences in order to understand at all how we can think about these strong substitute valuations in terms of these positive and negative bids but these positive and negative bids are potentially quite tractable for auction design. And we do actually have implementations of the auction uh, in two rather different ways coded up, which I can, I can uh, talk about a little bit more if anyone's interested, but I should really stop talking now. And I do apologize for overrunning so badly. <laughs>